Good evening, uh, everyone. This is Rajiv Shori from uh, the University of Queensland, IIT Delhi Academy of Research, which is a new joint venture between India and Australia uh, based in IIT Delhi. Uh, I uh, am the co-chair of the session. Uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Akhilesh Shivastav, uh, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of co-chairing this session. The title of the session is Data Management and Privacy in the Digital Era. Uh, I think there's a very important topic in today's times. Uh, and in fact, 2020 has been a game changer, as we all know. It has been uh, a learning curve, an exponential learning curve for all of us, thanks to the pandemic all around, uh, that the topic of this session becomes extremely paramount uh, and important. Uh, I'm ple pleased and delighted to share with you that we have three very accomplished speakers from industry in this session. Uh, the three keynote speakers are uh, Dr. Sachin Lodha from Data Consultancy Services, uh, Research and Innovation. Uh, the talk by Sachin will be followed by uh, the talk by Mr. Anand Virani. And uh, the third talk in the session would be by Sakshay Mishra. I have the pleasure and the privilege of introducing the speakers, uh, Sachin Lodha and Anand Virani. Uh, just to uh, remind the audience that we'll be delighted to take questions from any of you uh, towards the end of the talk or towards the end of the session. So uh, we will be happy to take any questions, uh, as I said, either at the end of the talk or at the end of the session. With that and much, uh, without much ado, uh, let me uh, introduce the first keynote speaker of this session. A great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Sachin Lodha, who is a principal scientist at the TCS Corporate Technology Office. Sachin leads cybersecurity research and innovation efforts within the organization and has a special interest in privacy related topics. His efforts on that front have led to multiple research papers, patent applications and award-winning innovations that are now available as TCS products. Sachin graduated with BTEC in computer science and engineering from IIT Bombay in 1996 and received his PhD in computer science from Rutgers University, New Jersey in 2002. Since then he's uh, been with the TCS Innovation Lab, TRDDC in Pune. Dr. Lodha was TCS's principal investigator for the TCS Stanford collaboration on data privacy. He's an ACM India eminent speaker and a winner of TCS Distinguished Scientist Award. With this, over to Sachin Lodha. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. Am I audible? Very clear. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, so, friends, uh, topic of my talk today is trustworthy data management. But since uh, the flavor of the session is privacy, I am going to focus more on trustworthy personal data management. And the reason will be clear soon. So, this default is digital, right? And uh, if we look at what Shakespeare said more than 400 years ago, that all the world is stage and men and women are merely players. And then one information age guru, maybe some 40 years ago said, the world is a database when database was a very hot trend. And men and women are merely tuples, right? But in this digital world right now, what we are seeing is both horizontal and vertical explosion of personal data, right? That we are creating around us. And it might not be wrong to say that we are basically now no more tuples, but in some sense tables uh, in this uh, digital world, right? So what has happened in the last few years is this tuple to table transformation, right, uh, on us. And let's see what are the implications of this, right? Obviously, this is uh, uh, great news, right, for organizations that want to learn more about us and offer us some personalized products and services. But at the same time, this all has tremendous privacy implications, right? So what I've done is, uh, knowing that later we'll be discussing uh, contact tracing application, right, and this being a telecom forum, I have picked an example to demonstrate you both sides of this coin, right? The utility of this tabular data to organizations at the same time, the privacy implications. Okay? I've picked an example of location sensing. 
so you can see in this picture here, uh, there is a car uh, that's probably talking to uh, the cell tower or the GPS satellite, right? It knows the location, right? Uh, this is a study uh, that came up in uh, American Civil Liberties Union, right? A few years ago, a link is here. So now the big question was, can this car fire on you, right? Uh, knowing your location. Now you could replace car by your mobile phone or an app in the mobile phone, but the question still remains, right? And now let's see what all it can discover. For example, it's straightforward, right? That such an entity will know your location by day. Now, if you start aggregating this data, say over a period of a year, uh, it will know uh, which all places you visited and spent time. Now you can see that a table is building, right? And you can query this table and find out uh, when did you visit a particular address? If we go further and look at a few, a few places where you have spent time, right? It, it can talk something like this. If you carefully look at this table, it's very clear that the first row, which is a private home where you have spent 348 days, right? On an average 12, 13 hours. Let me remind you, this example is before pandemic, okay? Uh, it clearly says this is your residence, right? And then there is office building, gym. More importantly, it also has a private home again, uh, where you have visited uh, for a number of days. So this could be some friend, parents, right? Some relationship. So in some sense, it starts learning about uh, your relationships, your uh, uh, interests, uh, your affiliations, and whatnot. Interestingly, in the context of contact tracing app, right? Now, uh, in some sense, when people hang out together, right? They meet uh, these devices, uh, be it a car or a mobile, right? Uh, they are going to be in close proximity and you can start building a social graph. And if you look at the whole use of contact tracing application is actually to discover the social graph about you, uh, about people whom you met or came in close vicinity in the last few days, right? Uh, to be able to alert them and isolate them. So all of this is straightforward possible uh, with the location data that is picked up by the app, in this case, by the car, right? So here is a good news that it's clear that uh, data is the new good. Uh, so my company TCS uh, did a study a couple of years ago uh, where we spoke with uh, maybe more than 1,000 executives across different companies, different geographies, different verticals. It's clear that uh, there is a trend to offer more personalized services to customers, right? Uh, and that's where they are deriving most prominent uh, business benefit. But then this is not gone well, okay? So I am kind of sharing with you some of the bit older customer studies and reports, right? Uh, that have been done across uh, continents in different countries uh, where people have expressed a lot of uneasiness, unhappiness, right? Uh, annoyance, anger on what has been happening uh, to their data. So for example, as you can see here, people do not trust organizations, right? Uh, when it comes to the use of personal data, uh, a lot of them want to have control over their data, right? A uh, most interesting finding is at the bottom. Uh, this was reported by an Oxford study uh, where they said that young people are most concerned about privacy of their personal data. The interesting part about this is that when the same group had done a similar survey about 10 years ago in 2006, the finding was that young people were least concerned about privacy of their data but that trend really reversed in a matter of 10 years. And the important message here is that uh, the future customers that organizations want to serve, the future citizens, right, uh, for any government, they are demanding privacy of their personal data, right? So all of this have been noticed 
right? And as you know, I mean, typically uh, governments are very reactive. Um, it takes time for them uh, to uh, bring forth something in action. Uh, but if you see 2018 onwards, the trend, the global trend has been that there are increasingly very, very powerful uh, privacy regulations that have come up. Uh, I think European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, has set the trend. So in this map here, I have just tried to capture two exemplary regulations around the globe in major continents, right? So we have GDPR in e-privacy regulation in Europe. We have California Consumer Privacy Act, California Online Privacy Act, right, from US. We have uh, a protection of personal information in South Africa. And as all of us are aware that India also has come up with a personal data protection bill, right, and that may become an act anytime. Now, all of them kind of uh, are very similar, similar to GDPR. So I just wanted to highlight some salient features of GDPR, uh, especially the fact that it has expanded territorial scope. It gives a lot of rights to individuals, right? Uh, so right to be forgotten, uh, right to object to profiling, right? Uh, very strong rights. Uh, existing systems that enterprises have are not really designed or geared for supporting all of these rights, right? That has been a big challenge uh, when it comes to complying to these regulations. More importantly, there are some huge fines uh, if uh, if you, you don't comply or fall on the wrong side of compliance, right? And overall, these regulations are recommending privacy by design and default approach. So as at least uh, as a security and privacy researcher and practitioner, uh, I know very well that typically security or privacy are afterthought uh, when people are designing their systems. Uh, but uh, that, that probably is not a great approach, right? Uh, and that's what has been uh, captured and recommended in such regulations. So overall, since market forces were not really making it happen, these regulations are trying to push organizations towards more trustworthy data management, right? That's the message. Now, what if you don't do trustworthy data management, right? Uh, what can happen? So there are a number of implications to the organization, right? For example, you may not be op may not be able to operate in a certain geographies or countries, right? Uh, for example, uh, there are uh, famous uh, companies who had to close their operations in say Russia or Europe, right? Uh, there could be heavy regulatory fines if you operate but do not do the right things. Uh, of course, that will come with some reputation loss, which can again affect your top line, bottom line. More importantly, uh, all these digital forces that we talk about, right? AI, cloud, big data, IoT, social mobility, right? They also rely on uh, very high quality, uh, good volume, right? Kind of data. And if you are not particularly careful about your overall data management, right? Uh, those things are also not going to provide you the maximal benefit, right? So in some sense, uh, if you don't do this well, uh, data could actually become a liability. Uh, while I haven't mentioned here, but I'm sure all of us are aware that uh, one of the biggest uh, threat knife right now in the cyber world is uh, ransomware kind of attacks, right? Uh, where uh, your data is a part of that attack surface and if you lose that data, then uh, there are some very bad implications, right? So data as an asset would quickly become a liability if you don't do trustworthy data management. Now, one way to look at regulations is uh, a pessimistic view that something uh, to be done uh, just from the compliance standpoint, but Actually, that's not a very right view in my opinion, okay? All these regulations are founded upon 
some very basic principles uh, that, in my opinion, are uh, very critical from trustworthy data management point of view. These are the principles that are there in OECD guidelines uh, from 1980s. And I have listed them here, right? So essentially, it's recommended that you only collect that data which you need, uh, your needs, you capture them in the purposes you specify, and ultimately use data only for the purposes for which you collected them, be open and transparent, uh, you allow individuals to know what data you are collecting on them, right? Uh, you ensure that data you have on individuals is highly accurate, right? And if not, you allow them to correct it. And you put in the right kind of security safeguards, right? Importantly, it says that if you are a data controller, right, uh, you are accountable. In fact, GDPR is peculiar. It says that the accountability equally rests on uh, data controller as well as data processor. What I've done is in this mix, I have also included a uh, principle uh, that is there in the European Union's AI alliance where they describe trustworthy AI because AI is becoming all pervasive and it has its own special demand uh, when it comes to the data management. So for example, fairness of AI is a huge discussion topic and uh, how do you make sure that AI is fair? So part of the puzzle is to make sure that the data you provide is uh, unbiased, right? Uh, so that's why I included here. So I think these are the major principles around which uh, trustworthy data management uh, could be uh, uh, organized. Now, I'm a researcher, and I'm not going to be very prescriptive. In fact, we thrive in ambiguity, right? Uh, so what I'm going to do now is, in the next few minutes, uh, I'll just quickly describe you some very recent research topics as well as emerging technology uh, that is meant to help you with trustworthy data management, especially in the light of all these new trends like AI, cloud, IoT, and so on. Right. So one other topic is consent. Okay. Uh, in fact, if you look at GDPR. Uh, the consent has emerged as a primary weapon right uh, that has been given to individuals to have control over their data right uh, these are the gdpr asks uh, that are clearly stated in the several articles they have and it's challenging as i said that uh, organizations are not ready uh, in terms of getting this right so while if you do well on consent, you can see here I have listed several of those principles uh, that you will be able to satisfy. Doing it right is very difficult, especially when you have legacy systems. So enforcement is very tough. In fact, bigger challenge is how do you even discover all the personal data you may have on different people and then link to the right identity, right? From the individual standpoint, you can see that uh, there will be consent fatigue problem. So I don't know if recently you have seen LinkedIn or any of those uh, online services where they ask you consent for variety of items. Uh, LinkedIn probably asks you for 40 different items and so on. Uh, it could be create a consent fatigue, right? So as a research and innovation team, uh, we have been trying to grow, grapple with this problem uh, TCS has recently uh, come up with uh, uh, our research-based offering in consent management called TCS Consent Management Solution. We have also looked at the consent recommender problem, right? Uh, but let me tell you all that I'm describing right now, uh, it's still all nascent areas, okay? So anybody on the call uh, looking for some good uh, pragmatic research areas to look at, uh, these are them, okay? So uh, this is still a lot to be done in this space, right? Uh, another evergreen topic uh, when it comes to uh, privacy and trustworthy data management is privacy control methods, okay? So broadly, there are three class of them. Uh, you can restrict query or you can perturb the output. But I'm going to mainly focus on what's called input perturbation, where you essentially change the data 
and use that data for further processing. And I'm sure many of you might be aware of this very powerful paradigms of anonymity or differential privacy that do that. Uh, these days, I hear a lot about differential privacy. Yes, it's a, it's a wonderful approach. But let's be aware that uh, all of them come with some cautions. And uh, there is no silver bullet solutions to them, right? Uh, there are still a lot of loose ends that need to be tied. Uh, and it's still possible that you may still not get the full proof solution. Okay? Again, uh, we have been working in this space for some years. Uh, we again have uh, built in some of our own proprietary methods to tackle this challenge, which works very well for some use cases. There is also some commercial offering that TCS has based on that research. But again, uh, open area, uh, you may look at any good academic conferences and you will see a number of papers on these topics. Moving on, I want to describe a very niche encryption. So encryption is again a very powerful tool when it comes to security, uh, privacy, especially in the light of confidentiality it provides. And there is a new class of encryption called fully homomorphic encryption, where it allows you to compute on encrypted data directly. It's a big boon for cloud, right? You could share encrypted data on the cloud, get it analyzed there. The result is still encrypted. You can download the result decrypted, right? And cloud provider will never know what data you gave them. But again, there are challenges. So good news is that there are a lot of nice open source libraries here. But still, I think, practically speaking, these methods are very slow, They're memory intensive. Again, uh, something that uh, our team is actively researching on, this is again a very hot area. Uh, several groups in the world are tackling these problems. We are also looking at some specific use cases and unique advantage we have because we are in TCS. Uh, we get to see some very nice use cases. And there has been some early success, as mentioned in that uh, reference below, where for biometric template protection, we could show some benefit from FHA. OK. Moving on, uh, there is another interesting topic called federated learning. Right. So the idea here is that you don't push data to the central server. Data resides on the devices where it was collected. And you are still able to compute a uh, common function. It could be some AI ML model, right, or whatever. Uh, it's a big benefit, right, because since this is protection limitation principle, right, you are not collecting very useful in the IoT context. You could probably get some computation done on the edge devices. But again, there are several challenges. Again, this is a very evolving area. Uh, first paper came in 2016 uh, by Google. A uh, lot of work happening right now. Uh, even though, architecturally speaking, we believe that this may offer privacy, there are still issues with this. Since random nodes are joining, uh, we don't know about the trust part here, right? There could be malicious actors, fairness issues to come in, right? So again, uh, as company, we are very keen on this. Uh, solutions, effective solutions here will allow us to work well with our customers, right, who typically won't be willing to share data. In fact, this is a unique position, right? The kind of relationships we have with customers across different verticals. We could even play the role of collaborator here. That is kind of brokering trust uh, between uh, different corporations, right? So an active area we are looking at. And this is something, uh, again, a very hot research topic. Uh, last, I come to a topic which is uh, dealing with fairness in AI. Okay, as I mentioned, I picked this principle uh, from European Union Alliance, AI Alliance. Uh, this is actually a very important topic. Uh, it's a highest priority currently uh, in the industry because AI is becoming pervasive. But for people to have trust in the AI, right, uh, they have to be assured of its fairness, right? But there are, again, challenges. I mean, there are several conflicting notions of fairness. Uh, some of them have been reported. I remember there were some 22 different notions of fairness, right? Uh, so that has to be well studied, understood, and applied to a given context. Uh, user perceptions are still not clear. 
partly because i believe there is still lot of computer science mathematicians computer scientists are really engrossed in this research we need to get social scientists involved and explainability of ai is a challenge right ai is sometimes very opaque uh, right so again something we are working on uh, we have a very interesting project with a university so the problem we were looking at is let's say you have two groups maybe let's say uh, white versus black people or maybe male versus female right and we wanted to see how uh, when we are onboarding people right we could remove bias and have sort of uh, proportional onboarding across uh, or more uh, bias free onboarding and we had this notion of train and then mask so idea was you train with all feature set but while making decisions you mask the sensitive features and make the decision and we are seeing wonderful results with that okay but again i mean this is sort of one one more thing in this uh, vast uh, research that's happening on the fairness of ai but very important topic to look at so in summary i'll say that trust is very essential uh, for society to function and progress uh, data is really the new crude but if we don't build trust around it then uh, both businesses and society will suffer so i kind of very hurriedly mention uh, issues around this that have come up and that have led to the very interesting regulations or full regulations i also mention few interesting research topics uh, that are that have come up and that have direct application to trustworthy data management so in my opinion it's it was an option people who take compliance you may think of it as an obligation but i think it's going to be a very strong differentiator for businesses and government to going forward so so i think as a community uh, we should do a lot on this with that i'll stop uh, thank you again and maybe rajiv uh, we can have some questions right sure uh, sachin thanks so much uh, in a, for an outstanding talk i think you really very nicely enumerated various challenges in privacy uh, in fact not only the practical challenges that industry faces but even some wonderful research challenges uh, that many of us are working on so thanks so much for a very enlightening talk uh, i'll probably uh, you know take the liberty of asking you a quick question and then we can again have questions at the end of the session so sachin you uh, mentioned uh, in this uh, you know this plethora of digital technologies that all many of us are working on one of them is edge computing and as we know that has become a very very important uh, topic today cloud was always there for a long time but the edge has uh, assumed uh, significance uh, in the last few years how do you see privacy uh, how do you see the paradigm of privacy being applied to edge what's the fundamental difference from the cloud privacy to the edge privacy do you see uh, do you see differentials do you see uh, what's your thought on the edge privacy per se thank you yeah so i think if uh, i were to quickly react to this uh, one simplistic view will be that uh, you probably were aggregating lot more in cloud right uh, with edge probably you will have a smaller level of aggregation right uh, that's one view uh, yeah, i mean i have seen work where people have been studying this uh, trade off uh, between the message passing that has to happen and the computation right uh, so if you go back let me go back there uh if we look at uh, federated learning kind of uh, architecture that has come up right uh so here uh, now it seems possible that without having to share data between the nodes or with the cloud uh, we can still get a lot of meaningful computation probably effectively and efficiently done right and that's a great boon um uh, in terms of uh, uh, being able to meet conflicting demand of both privacy as well as utility uh, that data is providing uh see i mean again i mean there are different flavors of this uh, for example there is something called as vertical federated learning where maybe uh, two different nodes have data about same people uh, but different features 
you could have horizontal horizontal learning where it's data about different people but same features any combination of that you could probably look at fit models here right but uh, i am hopeful that uh, with this kind of uh, architecture and there is enough freedom and flexibility here we could see a very effective and efficient solution uh, that will meet both privacy and utility requirements and that's a great uh, i think that's a great news in some sense Okay, great. Uh, so thanks so much again. Uh, we will. I'm just seeing that there are no further questions at this point in time. I think there will. Uh, there is a question here. Uh, yeah. So there's a question from NYPM consultant uh, uh, from NYPM consultant consultancy. The dominant players, Facebook, Google, etc., are all U.S. based, mm -hmm. which, along with most of the world, has a weak regulatory environment and privacy. are you mm -hmm. seeing these behemoths changing their approach especially given that for some of for some ad revenue uh, is main business model especially given that for some ad revenue is main business model great question that's a great question um, see there are number of things happening here uh, so for example look i mean european union has uh, gone back on the safe harbor agreement uh, they had with us right noticing that uh, the privacy laws in us are very sectorial right and they probably don't come up to the standards uh, that gdpr has set now right uh, so that's one reason why uh, these organizations will probably have to do lot better Uh, even if their own us regulations may not demand right now uh, when it comes to uh, trustworthy data management we are already seeing us now there is a discussion on probably having more of a federal kind of uh, privacy regulation uh, so far they have it in like uh, sectorial way health related hipaa there is ferpa for education and so on they also have state level Uh, regulations right but again uh, this california consumer privacy act i think has set a tone uh, it is uh, on line of gdpr right so i think we are seeing those positive changes there another problem i think is that uh, when they make their system privacy uh, by design and privacy ready privacy compliant it's hard for them many a times to discern between uh, where this individual is coming from and which regulations may apply in some sense as a sort of side benefit it is quite likely that all of us will uh, benefit from more stricter privacy norms and regulations even though our respective countries may not yet have set them so i think uh, trend is in the right direction but still lot to be done Thanks, Sachin. So uh, let's all thank Sachin for a wonderful talk on trustworthy data management. Extremely insightful. Uh, I think we'll have a lot more questions, and we can probably take it up uh, with Sachin uh, at a later point in time. So uh, thanks once again, uh, and with that, we'll move on to the next speaker. So I'm uh, <clears throat> a great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Anand Virani. Anand Virani is the founder and CEO at uh, Cutting Chai Technologies, a very very fascinating name, CCT. Uh, that's the name of the company, a wireless deep tech company developing leading edge technology and solutions that redefine communications between people, content, and businesses in an online offline world. Prior to CCT, Anand Anand has led the reference design and software partner ecosystem businesses at Qualcomm. that he grew to 100 million dollars in value to Qualcomm's OEM and ISV partners globally anand is a mobile industry veteran with over two decades of leadership experience with engineering product management and business development roles at Qualcomm Tata Tele Services Juniper Networks Motorola across the United States and India uh, it's a pleasure to uh, now invite uh, anand virani and hear him on his views on personal data protection and privacy over to anand virani all right uh, am i audible yes very clear anand 
Okay, great. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen. Yeah, please let me know when the screen is, uh, my presentation is visible. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, so my talk today will address uh, uh, the topic is personal data privacy and protection. Uh, but I will address this topic from the user perspective, or uh, you know the um, you know what we will define in a bit the digital citizen. Okay. So um, um, I think we heard excellent views from Dr. Loda that covered uh, the the research part. Uh, but I will approach it from a slightly different perspective. Uh, this perspective uh, is something which I'm representing on behalf of uh, a group, uh, which um, uh, we came together, you know, people from industry with a passion for, uh, you know, this topic. Uh, so we came together, which is now, um, you know, working with uh, uh, TSDSI, uh, and, uh, you know, there is a special interest group on MDPP. And I represent uh, the views of this group today. So let's uh, get straight to the uh, uh, the problem that uh, the way we look at it. So um, you know there is clearly a need that we are seeing of placing the interest of what we are calling the digital citizen in the center of everything that we do. So when we look at this, you know, from various perspectives, you know, this the the issue or the, this topic of privacy and protection. Let's put the digital citizen in the center. And who is this digital citizen? So this uh, is essentially a, a device user, um, you, know, a, 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 you know, a user that is producing and consuming digital content. Uh, this user is very diverse in their profile. So you know, not just people from the industry like me and you who understand the privacy protection issues very well, but you know, more diverse. This user is unaware of the risks, you know, that um, uh, are presented uh, by you know violation of their privacy, right? And are unaware of uh, you know ways to protect them. These are the users who cannot understand the uh, the policy terms and regulation, which uh, you know essentially is out there. Um, you know, I mean, even if you look at the privacy policies of the most uh, you know common applications and uh, software that we use. Uh, essentially, it's written by lawyers for lawyers, right? And uh, of course, with the GDPR coming in, uh, you know, there is this uh, what uh, Sachin described earlier, uh, a consent uh, overload. And uh, this user, the digital citizen, they cannot differentiate between uh, the implications of certain choices they are making and essentially what is necessary for this, uh, you know, for them to, uh, you know, be able to share uh, in order to consume the content or the services that they signed up for, right? So, in um, you know, in summary, uh, the digital citizen is the product, right? Der you know, um, deriving the uh, this analogy that uh, has been used recently in the industry, where you know the user is the product, right? So that's the digital citizen. I'll quickly just cover this uh, um, uh, to to kind of. Um, explain the problem better. Uh, the privacy project. Uh, this is something which was an investigative report done by the New York Times, um, and uh, you know they they essentially got hold of this data, uh, this large set of data of users' location pings, and this data was actually gathered not from uh, cell phone uh, data or from telecom companies, but uh, from uh, companies that had you know deal with location data. And uh, you know they actually then analyze this data to see if you know uh, what do what does this data essentially uh, show at an aggregate level, which is in the first image. But then they isolated one single user, you know, from this um, you know the set of data, and then they were able to then track this user over a period of time to understand the most common places where they were getting the pings, and therefore understand where this person probably lives, where uh, this person works, and the route that they take. Right? So um, you know, this is something that I use to essentially just uh, illustrate uh, this problem of uh, you know, user privacy. And you know, this leads to essentially what 
we are calling the billion users problem. Now, it's not a one user problem, but it's essentially a billion users. Um, you know, the people, I mean, this is a problem, a billion user problem just in India alone, um, where, you know, we have about a billion users, you know, with the connections of, uh, you know, uh, mobile connections and also over half a billion smartphones are being used. So, uh, you know, if you look at some of the key trends and challenges, and I won't spend too much time here, I'll quickly cover them. Uh, you know, there is a clear, uh, you know, the, the problem is frequent and global. So, uh, you know, every other day, you know, we look at, you know, some of the largest, uh, you know, consumer facing companies, you know, ranging from Google to Instagram, uh, to TikTok, um, you know, to Facebook, uh, you know, coming up with uh, reports of, uh, you know, data breaches and misuse. Uh, we, we have uh, at a global level, uh, this uh, this trend or the challenge of surveillance states, you know, there are clearly you know countries you know we are very divided in uh, you know how much surveillance they think is important and they want to essentially uh, enforce. Uh, so uh, I think India is somewhere in between. I think it's trying to figure out uh, where it is. Uh, but my personal opinion is that you know we may also be uh, tending towards a surveillance state. Uh, software and applications are eating the world, as you know. Um, um, uh, Mark Anderson very famously said, uh, and you know that is in fact where the billion user problem is emerging from. Right? It's essentially the software and applications that we are running in the hands of a billion users. And if you look at it, uh, you know it's really there's a dilemma. You know there's a uh, there's a dilemma. Uh, you know for the average user, uh, you know that. A, uh, you know, does not understand all the risks, but B, you know, they also want to, you know, consume a lot of the, you know, these services, content and applications, which essentially, you know, are also useful. You know, they also help this user, right? So there's, there's this dichotomy. And finally, uh, you know, the state of the regulation, uh, you know, there are, um, you know, many different uh, regulatory, um, uh, you know, efforts being taken around the world, including, you know, India with the PDP, which hopefully will, uh, get tabled in the budget session next year of parliament. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, there is a plethora of regulation, uh, you know, which the, uh, you know, the industry is now facing. So uh, let's look at uh, the risk of maintaining status quo. So let's say if you don't do anything, right, there's no solution. So clearly there are commercial risks, uh, you know, of, either the device vendors or, uh, you know, the application providers that come pre-installed on our devices or the, uh, the uh, user or the digital citizen downloads, um, you know, they using our data to deliver unsolicited content advertisements, you know, something that we did not really sign up for. So, uh, and then there are, uh, uh, you know, the data uh, being used by companies for, uh, uh, you know, for all kinds of other commercial reasons. Right. So there are commercial risks uh, of, uh, uh, you know, how uh, the data is being used and where it's being used. There are certain national interest risks, which I think uh, recently we've become more familiar with, uh, you know, especially, um, you know, when uh, the situation that came up recently uh, between India and China. Uh, and then, uh, you know, criminal risks are kind of also well known. Uh, you know, we keep hearing uh, of, uh, uh, you know, instances and examples of how our data actually is being stolen uh, for a fraudulent purpose. So let's let's look at a solution, and this is where I want to spend the next maybe ten odd minutes uh, to you know actually think about a solution. And this is you know we as a group, uh, you know because uh, most of us come you know from the industry, uh, we actually said you know what let's let's actually uh, try and um, see if uh, you know there is a solution or certain recommendations that we can make. Um, so the solution clearly we identified needs to be pragmatic, which is, uh, uh, you know, practical. Uh, it is, uh, you know, easier to implement. Uh, it is inclusive. So it uh, does include all the different stakeholders, uh, you know, which are, uh, uh, you know, which are involved or which are impacted. And the solution needs to be technology driven. Uh, so, uh, you know, given the day and age that we are, you know, we are living in with the ability for us to, you know, um, manipulate or use massive amounts of data using, you know, different techniques, including AI and machine learning. Uh, you know, we need to have a tech-led uh, approach. 
So, um, so we, we thought of the solution for solving for the who, why, where, and when of uh, data use and misuse. Uh, we, we looked at uh, the solution where the first party, so remember the first party um, or uh, what uh, you know, the regulation um, calls data collector, right? That's probably the most important relationship to this digital citizen because that uh, first party is providing the service that you are consciously signing into or uh, signing up to use. So, um, um, you know, so the first party, we believe that there is the need for a lighter regulation uh, for maximizing adoption, but with, uh, you know, a way to, you know, track, you know, when the data, the first party collects your data, um, you know, to essentially have an audit trail so that, uh, you know, then certain compliances can be met. Uh, we believe that the solution needs to be, um, you know, built with certain business incentives. Um, you know, because remember, uh, a lot of these uh, stakeholders, uh, you know, the data collectors, the first party, and the second party, and the third party. Today, there are various kinds of business models which range from, um, uh, you know, providing uh, premium or paid services and content to uh, completely ad-driven. Uh, you know, that is free to the user. So there have to be, you know, there has to be uh, all the right business incentives in place. At the same time, constraint structure structures so that uh, uh, you know there the the chances of misuse is uh, minimized and there is maximum compliance. And then policy and regulation to enforce where these you know these above uh, methods fail. So whether you know when the light regulation or the incentives fail, there needs to be a certain policy regulation. And uh, then technological frameworks in place. Uh, which uh, uh, essentially, you know, uh, extend to architectures, you know, tools, APIs to maximize the efficiency of solving this problem. Yeah, and uh, uh, you know, again, technological frameworks can be, you know, driven from you know modern concepts of uh, um, you know uh, being able to process large amounts of data in uh, uh, you know ensuring that the solution is uh, actually uh, you know being deployed and uh, you know is being adopted so we um, we thought of uh, a solution which revolves around this notion of data privacy and protection score now the reason we thought of a score is because a it is specific and measurable it's easy to understand um, you know for this digital citizen uh, and you know for other stakeholders it's comparable so uh, you know a better score uh, uh, you know means you know a better uh, implementation of privacy and protection uh, versus a, uh, you know a lower score a score can be dynamic which means that uh, uh, you know it can actually improve so not from you know from day one you know all the you know the stakeholders especially the first parties you know don't have to invest in ensuring that you know they are at uh, a score of 100 uh, but uh, you know uh, through the the measures that are implemented over time, the score can improve, and the score uh, uh, needs to, uh, you know, essentially the scoring system allows the solution to be flexible, which means that it can accommodate different types of uh, business models. So like I said, uh, uh, you know, certain uh, certain uh, 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 collectors or publishers that have a business model that relies more on, uh, you know, advertisements and you know, personalized recommendations, right? Uh, they their needs. Uh, could be different than what uh, uh, say uh, uh, you know when you sign up for a, a paid subscription to say Hotstar right or any of these streaming services. So uh, 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 so we also looked at what how does this score essentially then uh, you know become dynamic you know how does it change and you know which are the most uh, you know uh, relevant stakeholders that have an influence on the score. So clearly we talked about data collectors the first party that uh, you know the user is signing up with and uh, you know the data collector by way of implementing you know certain you know privacy features especially what we call visibility so you know in the in the ui or the user experience of their applications and software you know they can have certain ways in which the the end user can easily you know see the scores they can actually have a way to um, uh, you know control uh, uh, the you know give consent 
um, have visibility on where this uh, you know their data is being used and you know take some action if you know they don't want the data to be used by certain parties so something along the lines of what we see today on websites but you know that is obviously a, you know it's a very complex kind of an interface but something you know simplified that can be offered uh, on the ui itself uh, and then some of the other protection measures that the data collector can bring in you know some of the measures like what uh, dr lodham uh, talked about in his talk so that's that's uh, one uh, uh, influencing stakeholder and then there are others uh, you know so there can be aggregated and peer communities so uh, you know aggregators in terms of you know where these first parties typically sign up with including uh, the device uh, vendors and the applications that uh, uh, you know come pre-installed on the um, uh, on the device right in which case the uh, you know the device vendor is the aggregator and you know there the measures that they implement you know can also add to the scores um, you know the the other the third source can be from the user community so based on reported violations uh, by users grievances feedback etc can influence the score and finally uh, you know regulation and uh, um, you know any actions that are taken uh, from, you know the public authorities can influence the, uh, can influence the, the score right so uh, so these are what we believe are the key stakeholders uh, that uh, can influence the score and uh, the task for um, you know having or solving this problem uh, and the scope of solving this problem goes way beyond mobile uh, which is uh, uh, you know the most immediate or the largest opportunity uh, but it uh, can extend to you know all kinds of uh, devices which are you know internet connected so you know we have consumer iot devices uh, which are uh, essentially now uh, gaining mainstream uh, in India, in global uh, uh, markets, they already are mainstream. And then uh, personal computing and future IoT devices, uh, including a lot of the middleware and firmware which is available on these uh, uh, you know, devices. So, so there is an, uh, essentially a need to look at this in a phased approach, but uh, with a clear eye on the future in mind. With this, uh, uh, I will just quickly talk about, uh, introduce my company, um, Cutting Chai Technologies. Um, so we, uh, our, uh, our product is called Inventa. Uh, it's a first of its kind, um, hyper-personalization and communication solution for this online and offline world. Um, so we, uh, we've actually developed uh, patented technology and uh, proprietary algorithms uh, that match a user's online profile with their precise physical location to deliver uh, relevant and spam-free communication that optimize, uh, you know, the time and location and preferences of the users. Uh, and uh, uh, we also then provide, you know, analytics to our customers to measure the ROI of the communication. And uh, the reason why, um, uh, you know, I personally have, uh, you know, have been involved with this effort uh, uh, and looking at this problem of privacy and protection uh, is uh, you know because of the experience that we have uh, gained while building Inventor, which has been you know designed with a, a privacy first uh, and protection first uh, paradigm. So that's a little bit about the company. I just wanted to make sure uh, yeah, you know the audience understands where we are coming from. And so uh, with that, uh, I end my talk. And uh, yeah, happy to now take some questions. Thanks, uh, Anand. Thanks for a very, very interesting talk. And uh, in fact, the talk uh, nicely, uh, you know, the talk that Sachin Loda gave and you gave the different perspectives um, and they augment each other very well. So, so great talk, Anand, on, a, as you said, the digital citizen perspective, where I think uh, the great takeaway was the, the data privacy and protection score. I think that's where the, there's a lot of novelty there. There's a quick question over here. Uh, I think in the interest of time, we'll just take one question. And the question is from PM Consultancy uh, NY. There's no full name there. What is the benefit of a light framework for first party? So, uh, uh, see clearly, uh, if you if you think about the first parties here, uh, and um, uh, you know, it's it probably takes a little more time to essentially lay out, you know, all the different uh, types of business models that these uh, first parties deal with but essentially they are the party that collects your data you know the one that you 
the user gets into an agreement with right through a, either through a direct end user license agreement or indirectly through um, uh, you know a customer agreement so uh, if you see these diverse models um, you know it's essentially it's very important that uh, to maximize adoption i mean today you know just the plethora of various types of softwares and applications that we use and the diversity of applications and software that we use uh, is is such that um, you know if if we start to have regulation that you know becomes uh, is um, you know very stringent from day one then we will find uh, you know pushback and uh, therefore you know the adoption may not be uh, you know to what we need and then you know that will essentially defeat the whole purpose so you know the thought was that um, you know that is it's more self reporting uh, mechanisms uh, for these first parties but still have certain checks and balances from the other stakeholders and the ecosystem so that uh, uh, you know the the first party is still liable okay. interesting uh, i think in the interest of time we'll move on but thanks again for an excellent talk anand uh, we'll also you. probably learn more about your company going forward i think it's pretty exciting work that you're doing uh, in the current Thank times uh, where privacy and security have become paramount paramount now so thanks again and with that i'm going to now uh, request my colleague my co-chair uh, dr akhilesh shivastav to take over the session dr akhilesh is uh, in tcs research and innovation and he will now introduce the speakers from now onwards thank you so much over to akhilesh hi thank you rajiv and <clears throat> so let's all welcome the next wonderful speaker mr akshay mishra and i have the pleasure of introducing him in this session So Mr. Akshay Mishra is an alumnus of Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. He is the founder and CEO of the DSP Works, which is an Indian startup. Akshay is interested in electronic system design, embedded signal processing, and low power communication technologies. He positioned DSP Works for building embedded and IoT modules and solutions with an aim to reduce the go-to-market time. for the customers and the partners products that's kind of an accelerator and with this brief introduction i hand over the control to akshay for delivering his talk on security and privacy challenges while improving the contact tracing over to you akshay thanks satlish uh, and uh, greetings everyone i'm going to talk about my contact tracing initiatives and effort that we did some learning from there and the implications on privacy and digital era uh, i run dsp works and contact tracing was taken up during the pandemic uh, in may and we have some learnings by our participation here the device and interactions based on the expectations and discussions with various stakeholders in government private uh, players so I'll just walk over the same i hope my screen is visible we'll uh, just a brief outline in terms of how we are going to approach the talk so we'll talk about contact tracing the various a very brief introduction in terms of decentralized centralized methods and the hacks implemented and the privacy concerns which where the government is succeeding where they are failing or are they succeeding and based on that we will take it i think this becomes also a, some kind of a groundwork for the next uh, discussion which is a panel discussion so i'll just briefly introduce in terms of what is contact tracing i am aware uh, people who here would know just a refresher in terms of how things go so this is if people have something like an arogya setu or a variable they are more than 2 meters apart things are all very good and uh, all green if somebody comes within a 1 meter periphery of a distance then that is a alarm bell you store the device tags and these device device tags are then stored later if somebody develops some symptoms which are for covid 19 the cloud is informed or the device is informed and the other user who had come within proximity is miraculously informed about one of the their contacts being positive tested positive and hence they should isolate themselves or quarantine themselves this is something which was 
the basis of the DP3T, Aroge Setu, and various other initiatives which are app based, which became quite popular. In here, there are uh, two major ways how you identify whether one of your contact has been tested positive. They are either centralized or decentralized. In centralized, your device is going to submit your contact history to the cloud. And uh, uh, then the backend is going to correlate your contact history. And if anybody submits voluntarily that they have tested positive, then the ID from the positive uh, submissions are correlated against, against every other ID. And anybody who is present in that uh, contact list is informed. So there is a submission, there is a transfer of IDs from the device to the backend, which has a potential abuse. And other is decentralized, where the IDs, whoever tests positive, they submit their IDs, their contact uh, IDs, and their I only their IDs to the server. Server will then dissipate this these IDs to every device in the network. The device will compute, do a correlation, and if anybody is found positive, then the device will inform the user that one of your contact has been found positive. So decentralized is more uh, privacy preserving as compared to centralized. But due to various limitations in terms of computation, the number of, uh, it was not expected uh, that the number of infections are going to become so huge. And it becomes a challenge to do a decentralized computation. It has opened up a very interesting big data computation, even in this particular uh, pandemic. And there are a variety of ways this has been approached by various agencies and various bodies. Again, I'll. So this is the background. Then on the smartphone app that we see, that smartphones, the app which are used, Aroge Setu included, or the Trace Together, or the apps in uh, which are being used in uh, uh, Europe, they are all. We have found that they, there is a lot of interference in the apps. By interference, I mean that the user will not allow the app to perform as the developer had imagined. It does not go through that way. And they will turn off the Bluetooth, they will turn off the BLE, they will put in the background and the different operating systems have different ways of allowing these to interoperate. This also led to Google and uh, Apple to come out with the interoperable uh, BLE protocol, which was which earlier did not happen. So it was known as the Google Apple exposure notification. Again, BLE has a questionable accuracy, whether you have put it in the front pocket, rear pocket, you have taken into your hand, depending upon this particular uh, usage of the cell phone or uh, device, the range becomes a issue. Then the cell phones have a very low penetration in the uh, developing countries. So again, how much to rely on a cell phone, whether cell phones are going to cover the entire population and give a fruitful or a trustworthy result was another question which was being asked continuously. As well as whenever you use BLE, the way the BLE has been put on any operating system and any cell phone, it is linked to the location APIs. And hence, it was the user always, whether the application is accessing the location or not accessing the location, the cell phone always notified that the, your, your location has been compromised, which put a fear or a concern among users that their location will be used or abused which has led to, again, a lack of acceptance. Then we also found, when we studied this particular thing uh, in the Indian context, is there were many, I would like to call them snake oil salesmen, who tried to use, take users for a ride on contact tracing. In the month of May, April, May, June, there were many devices which came up in the market, very expensive, which tried to state that they are going to help you not get infected, they try to come up with, again, their own proprietary solutions and methods. Based on which, uh, we also thought that in, in order that these are not taken for a ride, we reached out to TSGSI, we reached out to various stakeholders that there should be a protocol and there should be a guideline so that all the, if there is any device seller, it should interoperate and talk to a central database so that people are not taken for a ride. And devices, if somebody has invested in a device, 
it has to work with any other device in the market so that they can use it otherwise we will try and create islands which will not scale and things will uh, be useless uh, as things proceed we also saw some very interesting indian hacks in how to use pandemic they used the very low cost ble tags they gave it factories and users they gave it to their employees they put raspberry pi which comes with a native ble raspberry pi 0 800 rupee they put it with wifi enabled with some scripts users they came in with a tag in a room raspberry pi will detect who is in this room and submit these tags to the cloud a central cloud if anybody is infected all they have to do is find out the time uh, stamp of who was present near this particular user the solution doesn't scale well but uh, it works well for limited users where the mobility is less which was the case when people thought that this will end in some time and they need to have a stop gap arrangement and uh, we saw many of these things and i uh, really appreciate these kind of thinking and implementations a lot that uh, 800 rupee raspberry pi 0 with a 200 rupee 250 rupee bluetooth tag gave ability to develop a solution and take it in factories and use them in which i believe were quite effective however there was a growing concern among everybody who used the apps as well as all these devices in a larger framework was how is my data going to be used who all will access it when will the data be deleted will you use me uh, track me either now or perpetually once there is an app will you uh, then there were apps which were tracking health parameters how long will they be stored again the os and device policy was not something which was very clear and the uh, it also was found that it is very impractical to assume that people are going to co- continue using their ble on the device keep it on perpetually which is going to scale to do a pandemic tracing or the willingness of anybody to carry a additional device forever so this becomes it has to come in practice which we found that it was a growing concern uh, again uh, my customer government bashing in terms of uh, i'll just point out at which government worked which government didn't work which policy worked so we'll first take to task arogya uh, setu with all due respect and it was a very good work but i think uh, to try and look at it with a critical eye so the last update from arogya setu came on the july 6th the google apple uh notification exposure notification came in after this what has not been implemented arogya setu has been left orphan there is a open source implementation i'm just trying to say in terms of maybe is it the reason why arogya setu was not popular is it this is the reason why arogya setu has a less acceptance let's see so there is a instance on github for the android app uh based on my experience i disbelieve that the instance on github is the same which has been released on the public uh, on play store but that's for uh, another day the policy regarding data storage the policy regarding uh, how the data is scanned is not transparent then every state so i had discussed with about three or four states with their it departments in terms of what they expect for it and iot devices i try to uh, bring up in terms of a Uh, platform for trying to do a standard with approach for doing a iot enabled uh, contact tracing if the states could use that expectations from the state were for local language support expectations were for trying to track users will go through that in terms of some state expectations where arogya setu did not deliver as per any of the states that i spoke to in terms of their expectations and any attempt to reach out for arogya setu's uh, request to work together open api feedback they have been i think the cartoon mentions it very clearly so there has been a little like basical approach and we could have desired a little more uh, from the team with however if i look at the global implementations they were there were open source implementations the policies were very transparent and written spelt very clearly unlike india these were nations with one language or majority one uh, language nations even then the kind of acceptance that you find is something which is very low france had something like 4% finland had in one day they had 25% but then the users deleted it 
France people, all those who implemented, they also uninstalled. There were also glitches in terms of how the app was working, how it was supposed to work and notify. There were false alarms. And as I mentioned, accuracy was one. Then there were some apps which are trying to correlate with users' presence, which led to a lot lack in enthusiasm among users. So if I see Indian implementation or Western world transparent open source implementation, then most of these apps were completely in the open source. There, there were issues which were answered, supported, on the GitHub uh, portal. However, effectiveness or usage or acceptance, I would say is not very different in terms of efficacy. Arrogacy 2 does not give out anything in terms of notification. And now we don't even talk about it. But so has been the case elsewhere. We also did our own effort. I'll just show our module that we did. This was based on, on uh, a Bluetooth device that we developed, which is completely in the open source. As I mentioned, snake oil salesman. So the intent was to come up with a completely transparent open source implementation, which can be used by anybody. It interworks with Aroge Setu. It can interwork, operate with any device which has a BLE tag it will store. And what DP3 mentions, what the privacy preserving protocol mentions is that the Bluetooth IDs should be ephemeral they should be volatile. It should change periodically, which did not happen in Aroge Setu. We have tested it. So we provided implementations for this. This is available in GitHub. Uh, as I have shown here in the cartoon, it can interoperate with a static uh, device, which can have a Bluetooth tag. So if there is a usage with your neighbors in time, if somebody uses a toilet seat, which has a Bluetooth tag, and I go and use it, my tag will store that ID. And then if there is a centralized correlation, the common point can we find out if there is a uh, contact or infection happening because of some physical touch, which can be traced to maybe a, a faucet or a, a toilet or whatever it is. It may be. As I mentioned, uh, the, our implementation is based on Riot OS, which is a BLE implementation using Nimble. And the protocol that algorithm that we have developed, we have submitted in the public domain. It operates and just uh, in the centralized tracing options because a Bluetooth device on a Cortex M4 will not be able to do the kind of transactions required in Indian context of maybe 100,000 uh, infections daily. So it has to submit to a central database. But uh, otherwise, it is capable. It is privacy preserving. It will not really share your ID. And it will notify the user that one of your infect, uh, contacts has been infected. We still need backend uh, tasks to be completed. The front end task, the device task has been done, tested also. We need some work on the backend and the backend to device communication and to maintain privacy and security in this particular link. The global efforts, Singapore, we are aware of Singapore having given in September a variable to almost, they, have, they are claiming that they will give a contact tracing variable to all of it, their citizens. This, again, the claim is there is no GSM tracker, and it will be used for contact tracing. If the patient is infected, the device will be taken, and then IDs will be extracted, and anybody who come, has come in a contact will be informed subsequently. So until then, uh, device mental privacy. And uh, HP has a ISB group, which uh, is looking at setting up backend and frontend interoperability for global movement among. They are focusing on EU movement for now. And if uh, other participate, maybe for global movement and contact tracing, when people are traveling from one country to another, how to do a con effective contact uh, tracing, as well as maintain privacy, as well as uh, ensure that the disclosure, uh, disclosures are voluntary. Our observations are that few state governments, uh, they wanted to track returning residents ensuring that the quarantine residents are staying uh, at home, which it uh, did not happen with Aroge Setu. It did not happen with various ways that they were trying to implement IOTs. Because while there were proposals, there are proposals from various uh, bodies, they never got approval. And I believe there the thought was uh, privacy won every time any such proposal came in. Because there was a discomfort at the 
in the mind of the decision makers so there was always that if you put some tag some leg band some wrist band how will it be taken up so this i have not seen i have seen lot of ideas we have discussed them evaluated them but i have not seen any of these implemented so i think at the end of the day there is a concern on privacy and it has won so far in all that implementation that i have seen acceptance of apps or such proposals in terms of using iot and i think a effective privacy preserving method which has to seamlessly integrate in our practice is still not found and hence all these apps are not working and i think they need uh, some more work which is why and they are essential and required as global standard based approach is required at least a uh, document which is why we are here but it is not yet available and i think vaccination and how the vaccination is dispersed and the privacy preserving when the vaccination is done because there are claims of using a digital health id or tracking with aadhar so i believe that privacy may play a key privacy preserving has to play a key role also when the vaccination dispersal uh, vaccination dispersal happens so there these are other applications where we as a group tsgsa as a group has to come out with some solutions and take it forward so this is from me in terms of our experiences and on uh, uh, contact tracing uh, thank you very much hi hi to share uh, that was wonderful you had uh, described the location its use possibilities the device requirements and the technological issues like <clears throat> while interfacing the contact tracing functionality with the aarogya setu or the bt uh, requirements were not met but there has been a kind of feeling that there are technology gaps with regard to the location the, the local server versus syncing up with the central server when it comes to adding the contact tracing functionality with our own to say to so what is your take on that uh, can you please repeat i see that people feel there have been the technological gaps in syncing up with the local server because on this contact tracing Thing, this data will reside on the local server. This is uh, it's syncing up with the central server, like where the ROG C2 data sits today. Right. So, are there real technological gaps? What's your take on that? So, uh, technological gaps in terms of the backend processing is something yes. is not. So, policy-wise, it is not. It has not been clarified. How long will the data be preserved? How will it be computed? And uh, will my location, my geography, be? used when i am going to when the data is going to be correlated if it's not used the data becomes numb up if it's to be used then we are not sure to what granularity will it be used so all these policy matters unless they are revealed it becomes a, and people at the back of the mind however uh, i think technical they could be technical experts or not they do understand all these things and hence i think the uh, acceptance does play a role so policy level in terms of assuring people in uh, for how the data will be used and the centralized the server communication between the device as well as the backend uh, sharing that the it will be done at the device not at the backend will go a long way in assuring the users but i find that that has been lacking not only in india but globally the assurance has been missing okay so uh, akshay there have been a uh, lot of interest in the audience and i see many questions probably in the interest of time i'll just take one question i'll randomly pick uh, okay now the questions are adding so whether there is a technical approach technological approach approach preserving privacy but is still leveraging mobile infrastructure that's from vinod kulkarni Uh, i am just trying to read it uh, yeah yeah uh, he has another question about this maybe you can combine the two just an observation for tracking covid test they used phone numbers as the ids and all that was centralized in state government servers there was no option it seems like it achieved the communication party very effectively so uh, there again i think uh, all these the way test seven handle the way data has been captured so we find that if i look at the way uid is handled then uid has given a very effective way that i need not reveal my uh, aadhar number i can only give my id and it can be verified whether it's me or not but still i end up sharing my aadhar id with almost everybody because people don't seem to understand the usage 
and that has been the case even here if i go for a test they insist on a aadhar detail they insist on a cell phone and if you refuse or give the e id based derived from the aadhar they refuse so this is not a policy limitation but this is the way instructions have been have percolated yeah that's yeah so that is something which is people your uh, acceptance and training is something which has been missing and not the policy how to overcome that i think uh, i am not the right person for that but i think there is a big gap there yeah that's a user user training issue yes and i think that there is the same thing which we see in this aadhar uh, implementation for covid right so uh, just want to know from the host do we have more time for this session to take more questions No, sir, we have already delayed by twenty minutes. Okay, so uh, thanks to all the participants and wonderful speakers of this uh, keynote speaker session, and uh, of course the participants will have the opportunity to talk and interact with the speakers in the next session on the panel discussion. And uh, so before we move to the panel discussion, uh, I once again thank for this wonderful talks. and very a lot of interest shown there are many questions which we are not able to take probably we'll get a chance to look at them during the panel discussion and uh, i request the host to transition us to the panel discussion part of this section